as I looked at the text today, uh, and as I looked at it over the last few days, uh, I, I looked at how God uh, was working through the Holy Spirit. Today is Trinity Sunday. Uh, Trinity Sunday is a day I preached in Northeast about 10 years ago. Trinity Sunday is a day that we recognize the power of God, but a God that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all working together in different ways. The lectionary this year brings us to the Spirit of God, how the Spirit was moving and how the Holy Spirit can move and change each of us. How God gives us this opportunity that we can be adopted, that we can be made right with Him through Jesus Christ. I want to jump over to a familiar passage to a lot of you. Jesus was speaking with a Pharisee who was confused but wanted some answers. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at nighttime and asked him a few questions. In John chapter 3, it reads like this. Nicodemus was a member of the ruling council, Jewish council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Nicodemus said, How can someone be born again when they're old? Surely they can't enter the second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. The Spirit in, in text, if you look, is a capital S. The Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We realize the power of God, and we realize that God's power of the Spirit in fact, in Genesis, in the, in the very first verse in Genesis, well, the first verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the second verse, my paraphrase sounds like this. Now the earth was formless, yet the Spirit of God dwelled and blew over it. As we look in Genesis and we see the power of God and we see that God's Spirit was moving God's Spirit was moving before we even had an earth, before we even had water, before we had stars. God was working all these things out and getting stuff ready, lining them all up, having things ready for us to come to earth. I look forward to seeing the Lord one day and asking Him, did you even know we were going to screw it up? I always wondered that. Did God know that we would be rebellious? And that we would mess the earth up for him? That will be my question for him. My wife's got more than that. She's got a lot of questions for God. But I've only got one. As we look in the text here, we then start coming to the understanding of humanity, right? And in the second chapter of Genesis, in the 7th and 8th verse, it says, Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and a man became a living being. The seventh verse, second chapter that was. God took some dirt, spit in it a little bit, made it, molded it, looked like us. Then God breathed a spirit of life into us. Without God breathing into us, we would just be a statue. We would be just existing with no spirit but God gave us a spirit just like him God gave us a breath God put that breath into us so that we could be like him and it will not as him but like him that we could be connected to him through the spirit I guess what I'm trying to say is God cares about his creation and each of us that much God cares about us so much 
that God takes and, and he puts us in this, this, this earth, not just to exist and not just to, to dwell around, but he puts us here for purpose. The purpose that God has for us is to worship and adore him, to love our neighbor with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, just as we love the Lord. And God puts us here for this reason, and also through this reason to invite others to know Jesus Christ, to know the love that Jesus has given us on the cross. In early church, there was a need for boldness, a boldness that we've kind of fallen away from. A boldness to proclaim the gospel in a way that would reach others right where they were. A boldness that, that, that as we read in the early church in the book of Acts, there were so many places that retreat would have been what most of us would have tried to do. Knowing that many have been killed for their faith. Knowing that many had proclaimed this risen Jesus and therefore live no more. But yet those brothers and sisters, those brothers and sisters moved onward. I've got this little gift that was given to me this morning. Little Bible, little Gideon Bible, a special version, never saw this one. Military version, maybe you all see. See, I'm not a veteran, I don't know a lot of things. But, but I learned this today. A friend of mine gave me this. And the first thing I saw in this was after John 3.16 and a tract of salvation, in here, the next thing is a couple songs. No, I'm not going to sing them to you. I love you too much to do that to you. But the one Christian song, and I believe it's in our hymnal, maybe we'll do it sometime. Onward, Christian soldiers. It's Memorial Day for those that have served in the military branches for our country. But every day is a day that you're all called to serve as part of God, his army, to reach out, to reach out in a, in a way that the world can receive so we can have transformation of the world through people receiving Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, in the, fourth, in the third chapter, there was a great healing. There was a great healing, and, and as people uh, uh, now heard about this healing, and, and this man was healed up at the gate called Beautiful Now, in the fourth chapter. The next day it says, the elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And the high priests called together, and they brought Peter and John before them and began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? They were on trial for being Christian soldiers. They were on trial for healing and leading someone back to the Father, connecting that man, getting him right, healed, and many saw this power. Many of us would back down, run away, want to take a moment and breathe into a brown bag and get our thoughts together. But we see in the early church what God did through the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Spirit and he said, rulers and elders of the people. If we're being called into account today for an act of kindness showed to this man who was lame and asked how he could be healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone which you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Brothers and sisters, if I only make one point today, I hear it right now. The 13th verse of the fourth chapter of the book of Acts in God's word says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. I kid around at home and say, I'm gonna get my masters of divinity real soon. 
Then I say I'm going to get my doctorate of ministry so my wife can call me Dr. Beardsley. She told me keep the bachelors because that might be what I am if I do that stuff. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. All that is is an expensive piece of paper on the wall. That's something that man wants us or woman wants us to get to receive education. But every one of you, ask Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. You can be healed and you can be empowered. I won't say it directly, but I'll say we got a new Bible study coming and a teacher being drawn up back there. Huh. But as, as we say this, I want you to know it's about being led by the Spirit. It's about asking God to work through us, not because of how smart we are, because Lord knows I'm not the smartest one in the United Methodist Church. There's a lot of them much smarter than myself. I am one of the best looking ones. But it's the way that, it's the way that God works through us is through the Holy Spirit. God works through us in the Holy Spirit, and you need to be brave for the gospel. You need to be willing to speak the gospel in season and out. And you need to be willing to speak up when it's time to question. You need to be ready to ask someone, do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you want to receive Christ into your heart today? Each of you in here this year could probably lead one person to Christ led by the Spirit. They'd probably end up in a church. They might end up here. They might not. But you know what? They'd probably ask you where you go. The Holy Spirit can use each and every one of you because the Holy Spirit used Peter and John, unschooled people. 60, actually it wouldn't even, yeah, it's about 60 days after Christ's ascension. Or after, after Christ's crucifixion. It was about 60 days later that these moments occurred. And God grew the church more. I guess what I'm trying to say, and we're going to end it here, is that the believers were praying. The believers were praying for the release of those that were bound up in sin. The believers were praying for the church leaders. The believers were back in the church leaders, and they were back in what God's movement was. And the people were getting saved. People were coming to Christ one after another, after another, after another. The God of yesterday is the God of today, and He will be the God of tomorrow. The Holy Spirit is not dead. God is alive, and God's life breathed into us, received by the Holy Spirit, reconciled by the way of the cross, can work through each of you to change the community in which you live Simply put, ending point. God is not finished with any of you. And God surely is not finished here at Kimballsville Church. God's got a plan. God has shown me this week through numerous things. Some were sad and some were joyful that he's going to work everything out for this church and community. But we got to love him, we got to be led by the Spirit, and we got to be willing to pray and stay together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have and ask God as we roll into our ending moments of the service that if there's any of us here today that have a need for prayer, that God, that we can realize the power of the Holy Spirit to heal up, to help us physically be transformed, spiritually renewed. And God, that there's a way that we can be made right with you by way of the cross. I pray, Lord, that we know that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. We know, God, Romans 8, 28 is a reality. Even the bad stuff in our life, asking you, Lord, to help heal it. You can use it for a powerful moment to change lives. 
I pray, we pray, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. In his name, amen.